Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Can I get a better response than that word, Cam? How are we doing, everybody? Good morning. Yes, we are in the Winter Garden Room, and we're about to hear a wonderful talk by the illustrious Jessie Gurr. Some intro facts about Jessie. Her love for web website development started back in 1993, when at the age of 12, she learned HTML and secured her first .com. Does everyone remember GeoCities? <laughs> With the black backgrounds, the lime green text, and the running dog, GIF or GIF, depending on your preference. Oh, those were the days. So Jessie actually started Iceberg Web Design in 2005, and she grew the business from two employees in her basement to a full staff of seven in less than two years. Jessie lives in Anoka, Minnesota, with her husband and two young boys. She enjoys organic gardening, making candles every fall, and vegan cooking. Thank you so much for coming out and sharing your knowledge with us today. And everyone, please welcome to the stage Jessie Gurr, freelance agency, taking the leap. All right. Do you want to shut the door back there? Move the sound a little bit. Um, good morning. Uh, so I'm Jessie, like she said. I, I own an agency, a small agency. We are in the seven in Minnesota. And I'm going to start this out with a little bit of a story. Uh, so once upon a time, way, way back in the year 2015, um, I was about 10 years into my career as a freelance web designer, and things were going pretty darn well. Um, I was making a respectable living, so much so that my husband was able to quit his job and become a full-time stay-at-home dad. Um, at that time, our kids were one and three, and we were, you know, we were, we were kind of living the dream. Um, we paid off all of our debt. We took a bunch of vacations. Uh, we even bought a new car. So I was, you know, kind of thinking to myself, this freelance gig is not so bad. Except that I was buried. I was completely stuck running my business. We went on a vacation to Disney World. Um, our, our son was two, and my husband took him on the pool ride. And I had to sit on the sidelines with my laptop, fixing a form issue for one of my customers. Uh, they went on Small World twice without me. It was it was the high of our life financially, and it was the low of my life personally. Um, and I just I couldn't stop thinking how much of a strain this was. And quite frankly, I was reaching the point of burnout. I mean, if I had to answer another customer's phone call while I was sitting at Disney World, um, if I had to add one more set of meeting minutes to the city's website. If I had to explain to Joe over at Aspen for the 50th time that his mobile website and his desktop website were the same website, so if we made changes to the content on one, it was automatically going to change on the other, I, I was completely at a breaking point. I was about... At this point, I realized that I was not running a successful freelance business. I had a very successful freelance business that was completely running my life. Does this sound familiar to anybody here? Yeah. So I want to kind of get a feel um, before before we dive in for who we have here. I'm curious how many of you are freelancers? A lot of people. How many of you are the main point of contact for your customer? Uh -huh. How many of you could take your cell phone, take your laptop, set them aside, walk out the door, tomorrow and take a week's on vacation without giving customers any notice. Yeah, a couple of you. <laughs> so this is, this is why I'm giving this talk. Um, this is kind of my driving force behind this. Um, in 2015, uh, kind of when I started to make a shift, I went to a BNI networking group. A lot of you are in networking organizations familiar with this. A business strategist stood up and he said, you guys, a good business makes money, but a great business makes money. You. And I went home that day from the, the networking meeting and I sat there in my home office in my basement and I thought long harder about this. Good business makes money. I make money. A great business makes money without you. And I decided then that something had to change. I sat down, I took a really close look at all of our operations, everything that I was doing, and I I decided that I had to, I had to shift. I had to get myself out of that hot seat. I had to stop being the only person that my customers relied on when they called. Fast forward, this is January of 2015. Um, I took the entire second half of January 15 off 
2018, January 2018. Um, my son, he is now five. Uh, we went to Disney World again, and this time I went on every single food ride 32 times. I went on the small world until I could sing the song forward and backwards. I did not answer a single phone call for the second half of January this year. I did not talk to a single customer. And you know what was even cooler? I didn't have to do any management with my team. The only conversation I had with my, with my staff was through our Facebook Messenger app, where they would send me a picture of all their cars buried in snow, and then I'd send them back a picture of Mickey Mouse. And then they'd you know, send me a picture of the computer that was open, and that was a little scary, but I figured they had it under control, and so I'd you know, send them back a giraffe from the animal kingdom. And what happened was I had two weeks of uninterrupted time with my family, I went back to the office, the sales had been closed, money had been deposited, the websites had gone live, and all of the team members had a smile on their face. And I had a smile as well. So good business makes money. A great business makes money to help you. Um, I should throw a little disclaimer in here that this is not a how to get rich quick talk. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go through here. I mean, if I, if I was rolling in making millions of dollars a year, I probably wouldn't be talking at work camps. Um, but what, what this did for me was it gave me this freedom. Um, you know, financial freedom is great. Everybody likes to think about that. Um, for me, this is a personal freedom journey that I've been going on. Um, and so I've been doing a lot of traveling, talking about this. I've been building websites, um, like I said, since, you know, the early 1990s. Um, I'm self-taught, as are the majority of my team members, actually self-taught. Um, and I can stand up here and I can talk all day long about building websites, about coding and HTML, but this is really my passion now. Um, I get a really great sense of pride every day when I walk into the office and I see six people sitting there who are collecting a paycheck, um, who are thriving in, in their personal lives through this business endeavor. And I get an even, even greater sense of joy when I'm able to continue to take my family on vacation. So the big thing, kind of where I want to start out with all of this, um, it, it, are, is anyone here thinking about growing an agency? Or thinking about yeah, a handful of us? Have any, any of you gone through this journey? It's starting, all right, this is great. Um, so for all of you, I mean, hopefully this will be relevant and you'll all be able to take back a little bit of information and apply this to your own. Um, but I really want this kind of to be the main point um, of this talk, is think long and hard, why do you what is your reason behind getting yourself out of the hot seat? Why do you want team members? Why do you want them? There are plenty of good reasons to grow. Um, maybe you are overworked. You're working 40 hours a week and 20 hours every night. Maybe you're focusing on your customer by providing super fast customer service business. And so things are falling. You're forgetting to pay the bills. You're forgetting to bring in posting accounts. Maybe business is really going well like it was for me. Um, maybe you are seeing such a fast increase in growth, but you just can't manage it yourself. Maybe you want to take it to the next level. Maybe you've dabbled around with outsourcing, um, or you're already hiring other freelancers to work for your freelance business. Maybe, um, Part of, my, part of my motivation was, do you want to create a job? Do you want to see what it's like to help someone else in their family? Maybe you need more personal time. Do you want to travel? Do you want to go on a vacation? Do you want to start talking at word camps? Are you going to get out of the office and start doing that? Or maybe you just have some desire inside of you to grow, to do something. Or Quite frankly, the real reason that I did all of this was because I was just burned out. I was completely sick and tired. Getting so keep that in your mind. Why? Why do you want your business to grow beyond just you? And we'll come back to that throughout this talk. Um, but first, I'm going to touch a little bit, sort of. So this. This is gonna be kind of a practical approach to starting a business, not, you know, there will definitely be some information about starting a team, growing your team, but we're gonna talk about the logistics because quite honestly, starting a business is not a cakewalk. There are a lot of different things that you need to come to terms with, a lot of different things that you need to learn, um, and things that, and a lot of different people that you need to rely on as you're 
business grows. So the first thing you need to do is figure out what your business structure is going to look like. Um, there's a lot of different types of businesses uh, that, that people form. Um, most people who are most of you who are freelancers right now, you're probably in a sole proprietorship. A sole proprietorship basically is a type of business where you, the business owner, is not distinguished from the actual business. You may have incorporated a DBA so you can operate your business under a different name, but financially and from a tax standpoint and from a legal standpoint, you are the business. Um, and so this is how most people start out when they start freelancing. Um, and it's also super easy to set up a sole proprietorship. It's you just file a form with the Secretary of State. Um, and I, I'm not 100% uh, sure on the laws here in New York, but in Minnesota, it's a it's like a $35 filing fee, and you just mail it in, and then you got to run a couple of weeks in your local newspaper so that people know that, that you're offering this business. Um, a partnership is when two people come together and they form a business. This is really common in our industry because you see graphic designers and developers coming together to share their talents and share their resources. Um, maybe you've been designing logos for 20 years and your friend has been developing websites for 20 years and you decide, hey, you know, let's get together, let's start this agency. We both have a wide customer base. Why don't we pool our resources, pool our finances? Uh, similar to a sole proprietorship, oftentimes a partnership also is looked at um, almost as a pass-through business where both of you have a stake in the company. Um, the things to be careful about with a partnership is making sure that you have defined who has the final say in decision making, what percent owners are you. Um, we had an agency in our town where that exact same scenario happened. We had a logo designer, we had a developer, they came together, they formed an agency, and things went great for about a year until they had a super messy public social media breakup. So, <laughs> So with the partnership, make sure that you're a little bit careful going into business. Make sure that you have documentation. You know, if you want to do a 51, 49% ownership so someone always has the strings, you know, maybe make this a financial decision. Have something in writing and definitely um, talk it over with your attorney before you get started. A corporation is what you will see, um, you know, most, most larger businesses. The biggest distinction between a corporation and a sole proprietorship is that there's a legal legal distinction between the two entities, between the business and yourself. So the business is taxed as a business entity and you typically would then be an employee of your corporation. Um, corporations can be public or private. A public corporation allows uh, for shareholders who at the end of the day can have a stake. So people, the people that you see on the stock market. Private corporations can also have um, employee sharing and other types. Uh, limited liability company, this is how my company is set up and this is also um, how a lot of newer agencies are set up. This kind of is, is a combination of the corporate and the sole proprietorship where there is a legal protection for your business. So for example, if um, my business were to file bankruptcy, I wouldn't necessarily lose my car and my house. Um, and it, it also allows for um, some accounting tax benefits where part of the parts of it can be, you know, can be set up as a W employee. Um, it's, it's mostly, this is kind of what you will see a lot of agencies set up until they reach kind of that threshold of 50 or more employees where they which is financially in their best interest in a um, A cooperative is a business that's owned by its members. So you see this with group co-ops. A lot of uh, nonprofit organizations will be set up as cooperatives where members will buy a share in the business, kind of like stock, except for it's more of a collaborative, individual, private um, sharing, and then members either get you know, cash instead of at the end of the year, perhaps they get a discount from the shop, or um, other incentives for supporting the business. And then the nonprofit organization is uh, an organization where all of the money that's invested is then gone towards some sort of a charitable organization. Um, or to a cause. Nonprofit organizations absolutely can make money. They do make money. They can have employees on payroll um, as long as they can justify their operating expenses. Uh, lots of great tax benefits to running a nonprofit. I don't think too many people in the marketing agency are going to set up as nonprofits unless you're specifically marketing to other nonprofits. It might, it might be an avenue if your target market is charity or churches. You may be able to find a way to
So back to the, the, the actual practical implications of starting a business. The very first person that you should talk to when you've decided that you're going to start, your, start a business is your accountant. Uh, you're going to need to find a really good accountant. Your accountant is going to help you make that determination in which type of business should you set up. Should you keep it as a sole proprietorship? Should you do an LLC? Should you jump right in and start a corporation? Are there two of you? How, whose finances are being contributed to what? Your accountant is going to help you get your employees or your contractors set up. There are a lot of forms that need to be filled out when you engage a contractor or when you engage an employee. Um, employees need to fill out W-4 forms. Contractors need to fill out W-9s. At the end of the year, somebody needs to wrap those all up. They need to report them to the IRS. They need to distribute them to your employees so they can file their taxes. Your accountant is the person who is most likely going to be doing this for you. Um, other things that you have to consider is unemployment insurance, comp insurance. Um, it's possible your insurance agent will handle those. My accountant handles both working with comp and unemployment insurance for our business. Um, and then it's really nice if you can find an accountant to work with you both on a business and a personal level. Uh, because as a business owner, your finances are a lot trickier than someone else's collecting their paycheck and bringing them home. There are a lot of tax write-offs for a business. You travel to work camp, you eat at McDonald's, that's tax write-off. So you need to make sure that your accountant is keeping track of these things um, with, with a bookkeeper, um, or you know, you can have accountant and bookkeepers oftentimes work hand in hand. You may, you may do the bookkeeping yourself, you may bring in a third party for a bookkeeper. Um, but at the end of the year, your accountant oftentimes will sit down and say, okay, well, here's how the business did, and here's the tax rates for your business, and then here's what you collected. And as an LLC, um, the way that our business structure is set up is that uh, the, the owner collects a paycheck on a regular basis, but at the end of the year, there is either a dividend or a draw from the business to kind of balance out the finances. So this is where I, I, I don't know anything about accounting. So I'm very glad that I have an accountant in my back pocket. We touch base at least once a month um, to go over payroll. And then we meet about every quarter to really kind of dive into how are things going. How is your business going? What do your income projections look like for this month? Your accountant is going to help you prepare for growth and plan for the next step. So after you have your accountant, Any business owner, even freelancers, I would recommend that you find a great attorney because you never know. You just never know what life is going to bring you. Um, if you are hiring employees, your employees probably should be signing some sort of a contract, whether this is just an employee handbook uh, that they sign to acknowledge that they, they know the rules within your organization, um, or if this is a sales employee that you're hiring, you need to have contracts in place to clearly outline pay, mission schedule so that at the end of the day there are absolutely no questions from your employees. The worst thing that can happen is you can get in a dispute with an employee over their pay. And this is where businesses start to turn sour really quickly. Um, so having an attorney draft up these agreements is an absolutely essential first step to hiring employees. Um, having an attorney review leases if you're renting office space is uh, also beneficial. You never know, you know, you may need to have a certain amount of insurance protection. Your attorney will look at that. Your attorney can um, do a little bit of research on the landlord and on the office space, bring up any issues that might come up. Um, if you ever have to hire somebody, and I have been in a situation where, you know, you hired somebody and you thought they were a great fit, and a month later it turned out for them. That's a really tough scenario, really tough situation to get into, and as a business owner, you're probably going to have that happen to you at some point or another. So having an attorney who can help you draft out the severance agreement, or even just help guide you through the process of terminating the place is incredibly valuable. Um, if for any reason you need a disgruntled customer, and you see yourself with a lawsuit, this is where you're going to need an attorney. Um, so there are, you know, there are a lot of legal services out there where you can draft up contracts online. I recommend that you actually meet face-to-face -face with an attorney who will be able to see you in their office. Most attorneys do three half-hour, three consultations. 
um, ask around. I mean, this is a perfect place to talk to other freelancers, other agency owners, ask who their attorney is, ask who they recommend. Um, you're going to want someone local. So someone, if you're here in New York, probably someone that you can meet with face-to-face -face on a regular basis. And also local so that they know the laws in your location. Um, your attorney should review also your terms of service agreement and your privacy policies and any other contracts that you are providing between you and your customer and then give you um, advice on how to either draft those or enforce them. And then the third person that you're going to need as you get your agency set up is a great insurance agent. Um, so there are a lot of different types of insurance that businesses need. General liability is the big one. Um, everybody here should already have general liability insurance if you're freelancing or operating as a business in some respect. Um, I mentioned unemployment insurance earlier. Oftentimes that is through your accountant. Your insurance agent may be able to help with that as well. Error and omissions, I specifically pointed out here on this Emperor Penguin. Um, error and omissions is the cover your butt insurance. So let's say that you make a website for a roofing company and you're selling them hosting services and then they run a big national television ad and the host goes down. And they call them up and they say, hey, my website was offline for 30 minutes and that cost me two million dollars. This is your error in the mission is going to you. you know, this is something that you did not want to see happening. Um, if you accidentally, or if one of your customers accidentally uses some sort of copyright material, maybe your customers are adding content to their blog, and they go take a photo off their blog and put it in their blog. I mean, you can tell your clients what they should and should not do, um, but if that somehow makes its way back to you, this type of insurance will in for that. So I, error and emissions is one that most business owners don't think about. A lot of businesses don't have, especially freelancers. Um, a good insurance agency will talk to you about this. In the tech world, there are some very specific agent, uh, insurance policies. Um, a tech policy or denial of, or like for hacking. Um, there are a couple of different policies specifically that my insurance agent recommended to me that don't apply to retail businesses, for example. Do you have a question? Yes. Right. So that should be, okay, so the question was, uh, so your customer steals an image off of Google and all of a sudden you're slapped with a copyright infringement lawsuit. Um, can you cover that in the upfront? Yeah, that would be a great question for your attorney and something absolutely to spell out. Um, you know, at the end of the day, who owns the website, who owns the content? If you are clear in your contract that you know you are providing this as a service for them to use their website, they are the owners of the website, they are the owners of the property on the website, and they're responsible for it, um, then that very well could be. But, but go back, talk to your attorney about this, and make sure it's in the contract. And if your insurance policy has to kick in, you know maybe you want to uh, bridge the gap between your attorney and your insurance agent. Yeah, just press the back. Uh, one thing about that, there's a type of insurance called publishing perils or media perils mm -hmm. that you might look into depending on the situation. Okay. That's great. That specifically covers copyright infringement. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, a bunch of attorneys will work with copyright and trademark law as well. If you find yourself regularly working with content that you are worried is going to be uh, copyrighted, if you work for publishers, um, for, for news agencies, you might want to talk to your attorney and your insurance agency about coverage for that. Um, news articles frequently are shared, frequently are scraped for content. Um, so that's a great point looking for publishers, specifically publishers insurance. Um, other types of insurance that your business is going to need, if you rent an office, you're going to need property insurance on your staff. Um, you're probably going to need some sort of an insurance policy for your employees. There's employee liability insurance um, that helps protect you from that disgruntled employee who thinks that you should have gotten to the when his contract states else. Um, if you own a car that you primarily use for business, uh, your insurance agent may be able to get you better rates for your car through an auto policy. Um, and then sit down with your insurance agent. I there are a lot of there are a lot of great insurance agents out there. I work with a broker. 
Um, so my agent, she's able to shop around a lot of different large companies. And so every year we sit down and review. You know, and she asks the questions, how many staff do you have this year? How many hours are they putting in? How many sales do you have? How many people are in your office? How many people work out in the field? Um, the insurance rates and the amount of insurance that you need to take on for your business vary based on your, your own individual scenarios. So at least once a year, sit down and, and review with your insurance agent. Because chances are, if you set up a policy today in two years, you're not going to be covered for the, the shape that your business is in in two years. You know, two years ago we had three computers. Today we have eight. It's a very big difference, especially when you're using twenty seven and nine apps. <laughs> um, all right, so those are really kind of the nitty gritty basics, the things that you need to have in your back pocket before you go. Uh, are you ready? Should we move on? All right. So the biggest, all right, so now getting kind of the logistics, the legalities out of the way, the first thing you're going to have to do is stop thinking like a freelancer. And this is one of the hardest things to do when you start from an agency. Because you've been working for how many years? Building up your customer base, building up your own relationships with your customers, you're running your business, and your business is running you. You're giving everything to your customers. And now it's time for you to stop doing that and work on your business. You need to take a step back and look at everything as a whole. Um, there are, you're going to have to stop devoting your time to the work. And you're going to start devoting your time to the business. I mean, this is why you're hiring employees. Uh, you're going to have to make some serious changes. Uh, raising your prices is absolutely the first change. Uh, the minute I hired my first employee, our prices doubled. And they continue to go up as we add staff. And this is just, when you add staff to your base, you are in increasing the level of service that you're providing to your customers. You're also increasing your overhead. Um, make sure that you're not being stupid about your pricing. Uh, price fairly. You know, do some market research. Talk with your customers. What talk with your customers, you know, about what they're paying now, what they could pay. Um, think really hard about what your business does. You're going to start an agency, that's great. Are you going to come out the gate doing everything? Or are you going to do logos and AdWords and websites and graphic design? Or are you going to specialize on what you're good at and then firm, form strategic partnerships with other businesses to refer customers to or to outsource work as needed? So think really hard about what, what it is that you're, you want to provide. What's your core service? Keep an eye on your numbers. You know, track how much money you're making. How much money are you spending every day? My, um, my VP of sales asked me the other month, how much money does it take for us to operate on a daily basis? And I sat down, I, I, and I had not thought of that before. Um, it was pretty easy, you know, if you're tracking your numbers, it was pretty, pretty easy to sit down and figure out, right, here's my payroll, here's my expenses, divide that out. And that number is shocking and will really change the way that you look at your businesses. And that number alone, how much is it cost you on a daily basis to operate, is going to help you set your pricing structure as well. Establish systems. Make sure that your employees are on board with your systems. Document processes. Um, it's super important to have processes in place for every single step along the way so that as you have turnover, if you have turnover, as you onboard new employees, you have documentation in place for them. It makes the onboarding process a lot smoother. Um, the biggest thing with, make, with, with starting a business is, and I said this a little bit earlier, you're, you're going to have to prepare for probably the biggest financial investment in your entire life. Maybe you're going to take out a significant business loan. Borrow money uh, from family. Whatever it is, starting an agency is not a cheap endeavor, especially when you start bringing in employees. You have to have computers for your employees. You have to have office space for your employees. Um, so keep this in mind and prepare for this. This goes back to talking with your accountant, talk to your attorney, make sure that you're making wise financial decisions, but be prepared. I mean, it's not, you're not going to be rolling in money tomorrow just because you've all of a sudden got an agency. And most importantly, keep your vision. Learning to delegate is possibly the most difficult part of giving up your freelance career. Um, this was the hardest for me to do was to find somebody else 
to do the things that I did really well. You are never going to find a web designer that's as good as you. You're never going to find a logo designer that's as good as you. You're not ever going to find someone that writes as great of content as you. And you're never going to find someone that's as awesome with customer service as you. And that's just the fact of being a business owner. Um, you're doing things your way. You're really good at doing what you do. And if you are going to start relying on other people to do them, you're going to see people doing things a little bit differently. Um, so start with the easy stuff. I, I started by hiring an assistant to answer my phones. That was my pain point. I was, done with the, I was done with the phones. I needed more time to focus. She took the phones. That was great. Um, so one thing at a time, you know, eventually I would still be building out the website and then she'd build out the 50 pages that came with it. So that was easy. Um, you know, and then eventually, you know, we had her actually building out the home page after I installed WordPress. And then she started doing that. Um, by the time that my pro project manager started, I pretty much picked up all of the papers on my desk and walked over and sat them down on hers. So the more and more that you delegate, the easier it gets. Um, again, back to processes and systems, make sure that you're explaining to your employees why you're delegating work to them, what their job is. Make sure that you set clear expectations. Um, and make sure that you're paying and compensating fairly for the job. I mean, if you're unloading something that you really don't like to do, either find someone who really does like to do it or pay them for that. You know, if, if customer service is the vision of your company, you're going to have to find someone who's really great at customer service and you're going to have to compensate them to continue to treat your customers well. And check in regularly. You know, be available. Don't be a distant business owner. Don't delegate and then go away. Um, help people through the process. Check in with them. Ask how they enjoy doing the different tasks. You know, maybe you need to find practice a little bit at delegating to different people. You know, maybe Jennifer's great on the phone, but she hates designing websites. Carrie loves designing websites, but she's great on the phone. And so, yeah. And so this brings us to actually building your team, finding the people that are going to be doing all of these jobs that you can't do anymore because you're too busy focusing on growing and running your business. Um, so figure it out. You know, who, who do you need to hire to do the things that you least like, least like to do? Who do you need to hire to fill in the gaps that aren't being filled? Um, what is your biggest pain point in your own business? This is something that we ask our customers. How can we help you? How can you help your business by bringing in someone to assist in areas that you're lacking? Right now, um, we have a need to fill a social media void in our agency. Um, and so we've been talking, we've been outsourcing, we've been referring out, and we are now currently in the process of hiring someone specifically to do social media. Make an organization chart. Um, there's kind of three tiers. To most businesses, you've got the, well, they've got you sort of as the overarching CEO, the owner of the business, um, sales, operations, and finances, sales staff. So if you sit down and think about, you know, how big do you want your business to be? And what are the areas in your business that need to be filled? Um, everybody's going to need a sales department. Is that you? Are you going to hire somebody to do sales? Operations, this includes your project manager, any design staff, development staff, uh, customer service will fall under operations. And then we have the finances, which will be you know, your accountant, your bookkeeper, um, making sure that payroll is met. In the beginning, you are likely going to be filling a lot of these areas. Typically, the financial area is the one that most, uh, finances is typically the, the part that most business owners hang on to the longest. And in my agency, we are team seven, and I am still the person that is in charge of finances, even though I do work with a bookkeeper accountant, um, I don't give control of that department off. Yeah. Um, operations is typically the easiest one to start with. If you can find a website developer, you can find a graphic designer to work for you. Um, sales, most of us at freelancers, or most of us at freelance are really great at sales already. Do you want to keep doing sales? Do you want to do the business owner role where you're networking? Um, or do you want to hire people? I chose to hire sales staff um, to free up a little bit more of my time in customer meetings. So once you have your organization chart, figure out who you need in your business to perform the tasks that need to be done. Do you want to hire contractors or do you want to hire employees? And there's not really a right answer here. Um, there are pros and cons to both. So contractors 
are people who are set up uh, under a 1099 schedule. You don't actually, per, they don't fill out a W-4, you don't give them a W-2 at the end of the year, you don't deduct taxes from their checks, you just um, pay them hourly, compensate them for their time in whatever fashion that may be. Um, the pros of hiring contractors is that they're super easy to find. There are a ton of freelance web designers that would love to build websites for you. Uh, there are a lot of graphic designers that would like to make logos for you, but still do their own side projects. Um, contractors are great because they're usually already trained. You don't have to tell them how to do their job. Um, they oftentimes have a high skill set, and they're going to come in and immediately start producing for your company. Um, you don't have to worry about payroll. You don't have to go down that route with your accountant if you have an entire contractor-based company, um, and they're super easy to get rid of. So if you've got a contractor and you're sending them a lot of website projects, and then they're just not up to the ball, or maybe you're not getting enough business, super easy. See you later. Adios. I don't have anything else for you. Uh, the con to hiring a contractor, though, is that they do typically come at a higher price tag than employees, and this is because they are usually a little bit higher skilled. Um, they're hard to conform to fit into your business and get behind your mission and your values. So if you're thinking about why do you want to grow, how can you bring a contractor on board with that? There are plenty of organizations that have very successful teams made up entirely of contractors who are on board with the vision and the mission for the business. Um, and so this is from a management standpoint, how do you bring people in? It's, just, it's easier with employees to get them on board than it is with contractors. Um, also contractors, as easy it is for you to get rid of them, it's super easy for them to get rid of you. So if they get another job from your competition that's paying them twice as much, they're going to say adios, and they're going to head that way. And now you're back to the drawing board to find another contractor. Um, so employees, and this is the direction that I decided to go with my business, um, you can train your employees to fit your business. Uh, we had an intern that we took on last summer who had no experience building WordPress websites. She has now built 10 or 12 WordPress websites all by herself. She was full-time all summer. Um, she's, she's going to school for graphic design, so we kind of had that as a little bit of an added bonus. So the benefit to employees is usually you're going to see them stick around a little bit longer. You can train them, mold them in to uh, the people that you want them to be. Uh, you can get them invested in your process and in your systems, and you can get them behind your company's vision really easily because you're writing them a paycheck every week or every two weeks. They're going to be invested in them because they want to do their job. They usually aren't side hustling looking for other opportunities. Um, and employees generally are going to stick around quite a bit longer than your contractors. The downfall to having employees is that you are immediately locked into a monthly salary that you are obligated to pay no matter how many customers you go. So if you hire someone and you promise them 40 hours a week and you've got no work, you still have to write them a paycheck. You, this is in your employee agreement with them. Um, it's going to you know, change how you're set up uh, as a business with your accounting. You're going to have to make sure that you're on top of your W-4s and your W-2s. Um, you're going to have to deal with payroll taxes. Either you're going to have to hire a payroll person or learn that system. Um, and depending on where your employees work, if you are running a business where your employees are remote and working in other states, there could be a couple of you know, some tax difficulties there, figuring out um, what to pay them and how to pay them. Um, Firing someone, and, and I said this earlier, it's really hard to get rid of an employee um, emotionally. So that's just another thing to consider when you're looking at your contract for employees. Um, so how to find the right people. So I went about this by posting on Indeed, and this is what I have heard from a lot of employers, um, a lot of agency owners, that Indeed is a great place to find candidates. People are on Indeed all the time. With a caveat, we always tell people to find our job posting on Indeed but apply through our website. So we turn off the ability for them to actually apply through Indeed. Um, when you let people apply through Indeed, you have to be prepared to get 85 job applications. Uh, we hired a project manager through and we put it on Indeed and um, immediately got 50 applications for what So, yeah. You get lost in Indeed? Yeah. yeah. They, they don't, I mean, you apply for jobs all the time. Yep. Yep, he was commenting, Indeed's great for employers, but not so great for employees. And so I will tell you that I have never hired an employee that only applied on Indeed. 
They have all taken the measure to find the listing on Indeed and go to our website and apply. Uh, we also, at the bottom of every ad, encourage walk-in. Come walk-in and drop off your resume. That gives us a really quick 10-minute impromptu, hey, who are you? Do we like you? Will you fit with us? And that helps a lot with screening candidates. So for those of you looking for jobs on Indeed, I would recommend absolutely going the extra mile. Um, and, and pay attention if you're hiring to the employees that do do that because 50 resumes on Indeed mean nothing. You can look through resumes all day long. You don't know if they wrote their resume or if they paid someone to write their resume. And you don't know anything about the person unless you screen them. Screening takes a long time. So pay attention to people who are outliers. Um, we read out everyone who doesn't write a cover letter right away. If you can't take the time to write a cover letter, then you're probably just clicking apply, 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 apply. So that's a good indication. Right, right. Um, use your gut. Use your gut. You, there's something to be said for just knowing that someone is the right fit for your team or the right fit for your job. Um, and look for people who are willing to commit. One of the things that I always ask in job interviews is, what do you want to be in five years? What do you want to be in 10 years? What do you want to be when you grow up? And if they're applying for a job as a web designer, but in 10 years they want to be an entrepreneur, I mean, is this the right fit for you? Are you just doing this so that you can go start your own business later? Or are you doing this because you want to be committed, because you like this position, you want to be part of our team? Um, I said this earlier, don't be a distant leader. Make sure that you're staying involved with your team. Ask questions. Do periodic reviews. I just got done the last two weeks doing two-hour one-on-ones with each of my employees. I got a ton of information out of that um, that I was able to bring back to the team and make changes and improve our processes and systems based on that. Um, ask for feedback and don't be afraid to get criticized. Being a business owner is a tough job and your employees are the people who are essentially running your business. Let them critique you. Get their, get their feedback. Value their opinions. And create a vibrant culture. That, I think, is the most important thing. Um, in our company, we make it pretty clear that family comes first. We don't require anybody to work after hours. We are a 9 to 5 business. Um, I have uh, one of my employees comes in after the kids get on the bus, and she leaves in time to meet them off the bus after school. Um, and, you know, do what works for you and what works for your employees. All right, so now you've got your team. You need some place for them to work. Uh, so this is kind of how do you want to set your business up? Do you want to have an entirely remote business? Do you want to have a place for them to go? Um, so I personally have chosen to rent an office space. Uh, we have a big open office environment where everybody comes to work. So find a place where you can house people if that's your model. Um, location is super important. The location where you decide you're put to put your business is also going to a little bit dictate the people that apply for it. Um, that being said, we have a couple of people who drive more than an hour to come to work every day at our office just because they like the culture and they like the job. Um, if your employees are working on site, do they need a parking permit? Are you going to provide that for them? Or do you expect them to provide that? Uh, and then don't forget to have your attorney review your leases, um, budget for rent, utility signage. Keep growth in mind. Um, if you are renting an office space that's, you know, this size, how many people can put in there? I don't know, maybe we can get 15 people in here. It's going to be super loud if we do that. How many people do we have right now? How many do we think we're going to have in five years? Keep that in mind. Look at the length of your lease. If you're signing a three-year lease and you're expecting to add 10 people in the next three years, is your space big enough for that? Um, ask around. Go and talk to the other tenants. Hey, how do you like working here? How's the landlord? Um, make sure you're super clear with your landlord on what facilities have to offer. Are there sprinklers? Um, is there, you know, where are the emergency exits? Is there handicap access for customers who might need that? Are a lot of, believe it or not, there are a lot of office spaces located on second floors, especially in cities like this that do not have accessibility access. Um, so who is your customer base? How important is it that customers come up to your office? Uh, how important is it that you're offering an accessible space for your employees? And then keep your attorney, keep your insurance agent part of that process. And back to the beginning, continually revisit your job as a business owner. Why do you want to grow? Take time to work on the business. Take time to work on yourself. Work in your home. Let your team run things. Sit back, reflect, and remember your business. 
And that is what I have. We'll open it up for about five minutes of questions. You talked about how your costs drive your pricing. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point, you get if you got pushback from your customers about pricing, the market driven side of it. You know, we yes and no. I mean, there are always customers who are going to push back on your prices because there's always a freelancer who is going to do that job for a quarter of the price. Um, I can tell you that we doubled our prices. We have monthly recurring subscriptions built in. We doubled those prices and we lost three customers. So. Out of 200. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, do you have any do you have any quick advice on uh, what to look for in a project manager? Yes, the project manager was the most important hire that uh, I made. So the way that I grew my business, um, I started with myself. I, I hired an assistant. She turned into a developer. We hired more developers. Um, and I, I have actually spoken on project management quite a bit. You need someone who is organized. You need someone who is super comfortable talking with customers, someone with great customer service skills. Um, your project manager is going to basically be the main communication point for your company. We chose to hire someone who did not have project management experience in the past, but had actual management experience. Um, her history was working as a sales a floor manager at a Valvoline um, and so she had a lot of experience managing people. Um, so I think that's a great skill set to look to look for. Um, someone who can juggle a lot of different tasks and someone who's comfortable delegating because they're going to be telling your customers what they need from them and they're going to be telling the developers what to do. Um, hiring a project manager was probably the best business decision that we made um, because it kind of took, it took the developers out of the conversation with the customers. It's really easy for a designer to say, I can do that, that's easy, that's easy. Um, I, I kind of recommend hiring a project manager that doesn't know anything about building websites. That's what you do. Because they will take a, a, a higher level of approach to running the project, and they won't have that technical know-how. So when a customer asks for something, they can legit say, I don't know how to do that. I will ask and tell you what it will take. And so that's the, customer, the project manager is going to be kind of your financial saving point. <laughs> about the, the sales staff. It mm -hmm. seems like I know a lot of companies really struggling with hiring, compensation, and, yep. and it seems like um, in hiring, it's either like people are really great and are compensated somewhere really well, or they just have a the Sales was a tough one for me. Um, when I first started growing my team, I was hiring part-time sales, and they never worked out. Um, I changed, changed the structure to full-time. We have two full-time sales. They receive a respectable base pay and a fairly aggressive commission on top of that. Um, and you know, I, I I've tried this different ways. One tactic is to provide supplemental pay up front for a while, while the sales staff kind of works on bringing up their base. Um, just make sure that you have contracts in place. Be super clear on what you're selling. Um, once you start selling sales staff, and once they start taking a cut out of every job you do, you're going to have to raise your prices. So, um, hire, hire full time, and I, I would recommend not making sales staff staff only full time. Through Indeed, but they had to walk into our office to apply for the first for the first round. Um, Sean is here today. I found him on Indeed. I got a link, uh, Indeed LinkedIn recruiter. Not Indeed LinkedIn. I got a LinkedIn recruiter account. Um, it's what a hundred bucks for a month, and I sat down and I looked through resumes. And the people who were the fastest to respond, the most interested, and the ones that are running. Yeah. 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 So we've been in business for 13, 14 years and are fortunate enough that we're getting a lot of inbound leads. So no, we're not doing a lot of cold calling um, for sales. Right, so that is a different, um, but in the past, so when I was essentially the salesperson, I did a ton of BNI networking. I still do chamber events. Um, BNI chamber networking events are a little bit of a longer play. Um, depending on your business structure, it might make sense for you to do that. Each of my sales employees do different cars while different chambers. 
Um, we were in DNI for 10 years. We made the decision to pull out of that just because it wasn't the right market for our company. Um, but, but for us, Chambers worked really well for the cold outreach. Um, and then we're, we do some mailers. We, we mail, you know, direct mail, and then have sales staff directly reach out. So it's not an overwhelming pick up the phone and call and call and call. We try to kind of work our way in the door. Um, hey, we know, we know someone else in your industry, or we just work with someone else in your industry. Let's talk about how we can help you. Recruiter. Yeah, I didn't use a recruiter. I did it myself. So I went, I got a LinkedIn recruiter account, and then I went through and just handpicked people. Um, I found that extremely useful, yes. And what I was looking for in sales were people who don't hop around, um, people who hold jobs for more than three, four years in sales. I was not specifically looking for sales in our industry, more, more someone who's been in sales for a while, who looks like they are committed, who looks as though they would be ambitious. And then a lot of that is you know, have that in front of you. You do that. And you'll get a sense. Um, one of the tactics that we use for hiring is also to have people take their strengths finder test. Um, that will tell you a little bit about, you know, about their, their strengths, their skills. Also, if you can make them do a thing, then they're going to be a little bit more invested in your job. So if someone's willing to go an extra mile to get, to get a quick time done, you can be sure that they're actually going to be a little bit more invested. Yeah, I think we've maybe got... I think, yeah, maybe about one more. One more question? Okay. So now you already have like agency set up and all the SOPs and the system in place as well. Mm -hmm. Do you find problem in you know employees following them or forgetting about it, you know, kind of things? And how do you manage that? How do I manage employees like so, staying on board with the business? Yeah. Following the process and system that you have already built. So our employees are building the process in the systems is kind of the way that I took it. So we've been really growing very quickly and every time that we add a new system, we sit down as a team and we talk about the system that we're adding. Um, no, we we really talk through every single project that we do and when we complete a project, we regroup and throughout the entire process, there's a lot of collaboration, a lot of communication. Um, we have processes in order. Because I didn't hire contractors, I hired employees who haven't necessarily always been in this industry. It was a new process for them to learn and to follow, and so I think it was a little bit easier for them to get on board um, since they they had a never they had never worked for another website development company before, so they were able to very easily adapt to my system and my way of doing business. Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. All right. Can we get another round of applause for Jesse, please? There will be a 10-minute break, and then the next talk is up at 11.